I'm Dr. Fekir Oberi and this is Influenza and Pneumonia Day 2. So far, we have looked at the life cycle of influenza and mechanism of action of endonuclease and neuraminidase inhibitor as well as treatment of influenza. We also distinguish between different types of pneumonia and we looked at treatment of community acquired pneumonia. Now, let's describe the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of antibiotics used for pneumonia. In this picture, we're looking at the bacterial 70S ribosome, which consists of the 50S subunit and the 30S subunit. The 50S subunit and the 30S subunit will come together around the mRNA or messenger RNA in the bacteria. And tRNAs will actually carry an amino acid and bring it to the ribosome in order to start a translation process. Generally speaking, translation consists of initiation, elongation, and termination steps. Some of the antibiotics that are important to know are clindamycin, linazolid, and macrolides, which all of, all of which uh, bind in the 50S ribosome, and they block the peptide, peptide bond for, uh, formation between the different uh, amino acids. As a result, protein synthesis will be inhibited. Other antibiotics that are important are also tetracyclines and aminoglycosides will bind to the 30S subunit and will also inhibit protein synthesis. So as you can see, aminoglycosides and uh, tetracyclines will uh, basically compete for the same site, which is the 30S, whereas clindamycin, linazolid, and macrolides basically uh, compete for the same site uh, in the 50S sub subunit. I have summarized some of the key pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic properties of these antibiotics in this table that you should review. Pay close attention to the adverse effects of these antibiotics. Aminoglycosides, for example, can cause nephrotoxicity, which is typically reversible. They can also cause autotoxicity, which is usually irreversible. And they can also rarely cause uh, neuromuscular blockage. Keep in mind that aminoglycosides are not orally available, whereas the rest of these antibiotics listed in this table are orally available. These oral agents can cause um, gastrointestinal upset. They are also available as IV formulation. One thing that's important to know about tetracyclines is that it can they can cause photosensitivity, so that's an important canceling port for the patients, so they should avoid, um, you know, exposure to the sun or tanning beds. It can also lead to deposition um, in bone and teeth, which is important in growing children. The major adverse effect of clindamycin is diarrhea, and clindamycin is actually associated with Clostridioides difficile um, infections. Macrolides are associated with QTC prolongation, so it's important to check EKG before starting someone on a macrolide. And linazolid has an adverse effect profile that's exposure dependent. So the more a patient is exposed to linazolid, the more adverse effects will occur. Now, generally speaking, linazolid leads to GI upset, headache, and occasionally can cause a serotonin syndrome, especially if it's used in combination with SSRIs. And within the first two weeks, you can also experience lactic acidosis. Now, beyond two weeks, patients may also experience bone marrow suppression. So this could be a drop in, uh, you know, white blood cells, so neutropenia. It can lead to drop in red blood cells, so anemia can, uh, can happen uh, beyond two weeks. Now, beyond four weeks, that's when uh, neuropathy can, ha can happen and rarely optic neuritis. Now, fluoroquinolones have a unique mechanism of action. They, in, they actually bind to topoisomerase 2 and 4. Therefore, they inhibit DNA synthesis in bacteria. Fluoroquinolones can cause neurotoxicity and tendonitis, which actually happens to be a black box warning. Vancomycin binds to dialo dialo or dialanin dialanin, uh, which inhibits uh, peptidoglycan synthesis. Peptidoglycan is a component of the cell wall in, bac uh, in bacteria. 
common adverse effects of vancomycin is Redman syndrome, which is actually, uh, we can actually avoid that by uh, prolonging the infusion time of vancomycin. And of course, vancomycin is nephrotoxic. Beta-lactams, such as penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and as, uh, astrionam, are available, uh, most of them, as IV. Uh, but many penicillins and uh, cephalosporins are also available as PO. Uh, carbapenems and astronum are strictly available as IV with no PO formulation available. Generally speaking, beta-lactams cause uh, GI upset, hypersensitivity, so a penicillin allergy is uh, the most common uh, drug allergy that you will see in patients. They can cause skin reactions such as rash. In high doses, beta-lactams can cause seizures. And also, occasionally, beta-lactams can cause drug fever. So, while we usually think of infections when a patient has fever, occasionally, a beta-lactam itself can cause a fever, which we refer to as drug fever. And we also can have beta-lactams in combination with beta-lactamase inhibitors, which I will explain now. So, what exactly is a beta-lactamase? So, in this picture, I'm showing you the core component of a beta-lactam. So this square part is actually the beta-lactam. So it's usually, with the exception of astreonam, penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenem come with a double ring that's infused to the beta-lactam. Now what happens is that some bacteria can actually produce a protein called a beta-lactamase. And what the beta-lactamase does is that it actually hydrolyzes the beta-lactam, so it will open the beta-lactam a ring and by doing that it will make the beta-lactam inactive and that's how bacteria can defense, uh, defend themselves and become resistant to beta-lactams by making beta-lactamases and you know beta-lactamases include penicillinases that specifically hydrolyze penicillins they include cephalosporinases that specifically hydrolyze cephalosporins as well as penicillins and there are can be carbapenemases that can hydrolyze carbapenems as well as cephalosporins and penicillins. So what exactly are beta-lactamase inhibitors? Beta-lactamase inhibitors are drugs that basically mimic a beta-lactam. So they're kind of like a square, they kind of mimic the structure of a beta-lactam and they have a high affinity for beta-lactamases. So because they have a very high affinity for beta-lactamases, the beta-lactamase inhibitor will actually bind to the beta-lactamase and actually inactivate the beta-lactamase. Therefore, the beta-lactamase, because it's inactive, it cannot hydrolyze the beta-lactam ring. And that spares the beta-lactam in order to maintain its activity. Now, on the market, we have clavulonic acid, tazobactam, sulbactam, avibactam, and weberbactam as beta-lactamase inhibitors. These beta-lactamase inhibitors are not available, um, you know, um, by, by themselves, uh, but they are available in combination with beta-lactams. Beta when it comes to beta-lactamases, it's also important to know the definition of extended-spectrum beta-lactamases, or ESBLs. By definition, ESBLs hydrolyze extended-spectrum extended cephalosporins and monobactams. In other words, ESBLs will hydrolyze third-generation cephalosporins, such as ceftriaxone and astreonam. However, they do not hydro hydrolyze cefamycins and carbapenems. So cefamycin are a subset of second-generation uh, cephalosporins, such as cefoxetine and cefotitan. So cefoxetin and cefotitan will maintain susceptibility to ESBLs, as well as carbapenem. Now, what's important to know is that ESBLs are susceptible to most beta-lactamase inhibitors, um, except for sulbactam. 